Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, July 24th, 2008. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, Chris Colby from Brew Your Own Magazine joins us to talk about turbid mashing. That's a mashing technique that Belgian brewers improvised to deal with smaller mash tun size that came about because of tax laws. Well, if you're new to home brewing or would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And as usual, you can follow me on Twitter. My uh, username is Basic Brewing. It's all one word, Basic Brewing. And the biggest advantage to that is you get to you get to uh, know when the new episodes come out, which is especially important on the video side. We have uh, shirts of many colors now. Well, maybe not many colors, but several, or at least a few. We have five new colors. <laughs> Up to any, uh, up, up till now, uh, you could have any color of basic brewing shirt as long as it was white. Well, now you can have black, gray, gold, green, and brown, too. The reason I, the, there are those colors is I tried to match the shirt colors with the uh, basic brewing logo that's emblazoned on the chest. So you can see those at our online shop on uh, basicbrewingshop.com. Just go to the apparel section. And if you get a basic brewing shirt and you go to a cool place while wearing it, send us a picture, like David and Lori did from Saratoga Springs, New York. They went to Brewery Omegang, and they uh, sent in a shot of both of them wearing our striking apparel. And you can see that on our gallery page on basicbrewing.com. And thanks to David and Lori for sending that in. It's always cool to get a shot of someone wearing our stuff. Congratulations to Big Foamy Head on their third anniversary, on their recent anniversary show. They drank some homebrews that that I'd sent them a while back, and uh, they were very kind in talking about the beers, so I appreciate that. You can find them at BigFoamyHead.com, of course. And speaking of podcasts, this week I posted a new episode of Basic Brewing Video featuring a tour of a brewery that Steve and I visited while we were out in Cincinnati The Mount Carmel Brewing Company is a commercial brewery that's actually at the brewer's house. So it is a home brewery that's making money. It started out in the basement, but uh, now it's got its own space out back. It's very cool. And uh, we appreciate Mike Dewey's hospitality during our visit. And you can hear an interview with Mike uh, with our special guest, Jeff Bearer from Craft Beer Radio, next week on this particular podcast. Greg Muncy, or Greg from Muncy, Indiana, not Greg Muncy. Uh, <laughs> Greg from Muncy, Indiana, watched the uh, video podcast from Cincinnati, the uh, the brewery, the Mount Carmel Brewing Company, <clears throat> and they uh, they bottle in, in growlers there. And Greg asks, "I just watched the latest video, and I have a question for you: Is it feasible to bottle some of my homebrew directly into growlers?" Well, sure. You can uh, prime your beer as usual in a priming bucket, like I do, and just bottle some of your beer in a sanitized growler, just as if you were putting it into a 12-ounce bottle. Or, if you're going to bottle some in growlers and keg the rest and want a bottle condition, you can find a a priming sugar calculator online through Google. Just look for priming sugar calculator. And uh, therefore, you can calculate how much priming sugar goes into each growler, because it's important got to put the appropriate amount of sugar in there. Uh, Greg also says, I finally entered my first home brewing competition, the Indiana State Fair Brewers Cup, and won absolutely nothing. <laughs> Sorry about that, Greg. Uh, since then, he says, however, I learned that my parents both love my brown ale and actually have been arguing about who is drinking more of the case I brought them. Shouldn't I get extra competition points because my mom likes my beer. Well, what do you think? Let's think about this. Who Who is it more important to impress? Faceless judges at a state fair or the woman who, who brought you into the world? Just, I'd, 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 be, I'd be more impressed with your mom liking your beer. Of course, she doesn't give you something you can hang on your wall, but uh, <laughs> she gave you life. What do you expect? Uh, by the way, along those same lines, Bonus Beer Bob from the Good Beer Show 
sent a picture of himself holding a blue ribbon from the Indiana State Fair that he won with his uh, Russian Imperial Stout. So, great job, Bob. But the big question is, does your mom like your beer? That's the most important thing. <laughs> uh, Dave, our buddy Dave from Little Rock, um, he sent us a note correcting me or sending me, giving me more facts uh, about the KitchenAid grain mill. You might remember last time we had a listener write in asking, uh, should he get a dedicated grain mill that was made for brewing grains, or should he slip the purchase past his wife by by buying an attachment, a grain mill attachment for his KitchenAid um, mixer? And I, I basically told him to go for the dedicated grain mill. But Dave says, I'm responding to Dave from Burlington on the KitchenAid grain mill. Dave says, my wife purchased one for me about two years ago as a birthday gift, and it works great. I set it to the most coarse setting, and it mills the grains perfectly. Never had a stuck sparge. Dave says it's strong enough to handle any of the grains or spices that you throw at it, and it never bogs down, and I never get tired from cranking. The only downside to the mill attachment is that the hopper is small, and it will only hold about three or four cups of grain at a time. It takes about five minutes to mill a 10-pound uh, bag of grain. Dave says, I would highly recommend using one if you can find it. So there you go. A correction from last week's show shows you that um, <clears throat> maybe the, some of the information that you find online may not be completely accurate. Imagine that. Uh, <laughs> so thanks, thanks to Dave from Little Rock helping out. Uh, Dave from, from Burlington. So, Ryan from uh, Rockford, Michigan, has been hearing me talk about my Arkansas Goldings hops, which I, I used to call them East Kent Goldings until I was corrected because, you know, I don't leave, I, I, don't, I don't live in East Kent. But Ryan says, I happen to live in the eastern half of Kent County in Michigan. He says, that makes the Golding hops I'm growing in my backyard East Kent Goldings. So there you go. Authentic American East Kent Goldings from Michigan. Of course, Ryan, that means that you can you can have East Kent Cascades, too, if you want. I bet you. <laughs> and uh, by the way, my uh, Arkansas Goldings are finally hitting their stride. They're, they're climbing like mad up, their, up the twine there and even putting on a few blooms. So it may have been a little too wet for them at the beginning of the season. And they, they seem a whole lot more happy now, as do some of the others as well. So I, I I feel a little bad for talking badly about them for so long. David from Lowell, Arkansas, which is uh, within spitting distance from here, basically, says, I've recently had success downloading your podcasts to my creative Zen uh, Vision M. Your show was my first attempt at a podcast downloaded to my MP3 player. I have a two-year-old Creative Zen Vision M. The podcast file type that you provide was incompatible with my older player, so I just listened to the podcasts on my computer. Recently, however, I did some more testing to try to make it work. I found a file called the Zencast Organizer. David says, I assume that it is new. The software is shareware and can be found at zencast.com slash downloads. It allows me to play both your radio and video podcasts, or should I say Zencasts, he says, on my non-iPod device. I thought that the information might be helpful for some of your listeners. Well, thanks, David. I appreciate that. File formats, especially on the video side, have always been a, a pain in the patootie uh, in electronic media uh, publishing, so I'm, I'm glad you found a solution. And uh, maybe that will help some others out there, too. So Zencast.com slash downloads if you're having issues with your Zencast player. Neil writes in to say, I just moved from the San Francisco Bay Area to Geneva, Switzerland. Do you or any of your listeners have any tips on homebrewing in Switzerland? Is it legal, and where do you get supplies? I don't know about that one. It, seem, it seems like I've heard from listeners in Switzerland before, but I don't, I don't remember exactly. So if you know about homebrewing in Switzerland, drop me a line at uh, james at basicbrewing.com or just use the contact form on basicbrewing.com and I'll forward it to Neil. 
Can't have him not brewing in his new home. Uh, Danny from Gainesville, Florida writes, I was wondering if you could go over solutions for missing the original gravity in partial mash beers. On my last APA, I was seven points low. My main concern is the final beer tasting watery and or too hop accentuated. Uh, uh, Danny says, I can think of adding additional dry malt extract, corn sugar, maltodextrin, or something like the Brewvent alcohol boost, a maltose slash glucose blend that Austin Homebrew sells. How would the flavor profile be affected by adding each of these, and are there any formulas to determine exactly how much to add to hit the desired final gravity? Well, Danny, if you if you do add sugar, like dextrose, or maybe the maltose glucose blend, uh, or you know table sugar, which is sucrose, I believe, you'll you will increase your gravity, but in the end, you'll also thin out your beer because the yeast is going to just zoom right through that. It's uh, pretty much all fermentable so on the potential positive side of that if you're shooting for it you might get a, a dried more belgiany beer but if you add too much of that sugar you can get some cidery characteristics if you're not careful so uh, maltodextrin would have the opposite effect adding more body to your beer so if i were you i would add more dry malt extract um dme is essentially unhopped wort with uh, most of the water taken out. And according to uh, Ray Daniels Designing Great Beers, DME has an extract potential of uh, 1045. So in other words, if you add one pound of DME to one gallon of water, you'll get a wort of around 1.045 specific gravity. So you can do that to, or you can use that figure to do a bit of math. And uh, hopefully you can figure uh, from that how much you would need to add. So, hope that helps. Uh, Let's move on, shall we? Now, in the the last episode, we talked to Randy Mosher, you may remember, about some of the obscure Belgian styles he discovered in a rare old book that he found on eBay. Well, this week, coincidentally, we get more in-depth on the technical side of one of the techniques that Randy was referring to. And uh, we talked to Chris Colby of Brew Your Own Magazine about turbid mashing. Well, Chris Colby, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Hello, James. It's been a while. It's uh, yeah. We've had a lot of coverage from the uh, the conference in Cincinnati. And to tell you the truth, I'm kind of rusty here uh, doing interviews again. So I've, I've been lazy. I've just been playing pre-recorded stuff. So you'll have to forgive me if I uh, if I clumsily... You know, stagger through the the first part of this at least. Uh, before we go into to turbid mashing, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, your your barley crop because we have talked in the past about uh, you know you you were planning to plant some barley uh, on your property in your garden and and harvest it yourself and malt it yourself and how's that going? Well, uh, as it turns out, you need actual live barley to be able to malt it. <laughs> And uh, so, so this year the plan has hit a bit of a snag that way. Um, I, uh, I I had some robust barley, which is a six row variety, which is just one I could find on online. And I planted it in the spring of this year as a spring barley. Um, and it grew up. And uh, barley goes actually through several stages of growth. There's a um, one of the first to, you know it emerges. It goes through a stage called tillering, where it, it sets off new leaves and tillers, which are sort of different sprouts or whatever. Um, and then it gets to a stage called the boot stage, which is basically the the head of the barley where, you know, where all the, the kernels are, um, is formed, but it's got like a, a leaf wrapped around it, which I guess they call a boot. Um, and uh, after that stage, the, you know, the head uh, pokes out of the, out of the boot and it, you know, develops into the whole, uh, you know, uh, grain, and, and, and there's several stages to filling the grain or whatever. But anyway, my barley got, my barley got to the boot stage, and it just all died. Mm. Um, I, I had some wheat planted that actually made it all the way through, although the, the kernels were kind of small. But, yeah, the barley just died, and I went looking around for reasons why that might be, and I read that it sort of uh, 
or not sort of, I read that it's uh, not very heat tolerant. So I'm going to try to replant it this year as a winter barley. I'll plant it in November, and uh, it'll sort of overwinter. It's, you know, overwinter here being, you know, high of 70 degrees during the day. Uh, and uh, hopefully grow up in the spring and mature before, you know, it hits any, uh, you know, sort of heat uh, barrier or whatever. This was this year was the hottest May June in record here in Austin, so it was uh, just not not a happy uh, environment for the uh, barley. So your boots weren't made for stalking. Mm-mm. <laughs> no, <laughs> they were made for turning brown and dying. <laughs> well, uh, I'm hoping to have better luck up here in Northwest Arkansas. It's been wet, 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 and I've been busy, busy, busy. So uh, a couple of days ago. I finally planted mine, uh, and I watered them in. So we'll we'll see what happens with that. I've had a farmer friend suggest to me that maybe barley should be better planted in the fall, or you know maybe the early winter. So I guess we'll see how that goes. Um, so I appreciate the appreciate the update on the on the barley situation. Maybe you'll have better luck in the in the in the cooler months. Yeah, I um. I haven't decided exactly, but I mean, one option too, I might try planting little blocks of it at different times. Like I could start as soon as, you know, uh, you know, maybe right after September, you know, start planting a little block in October and maybe another one halfway through October, then, you know, one in November, halfway through November, uh, something like that, just to see if I, uh, can time it, you know, well for, for this growing region. Cause, uh, uh, if you search the web for barley and barley growth and uh, barley farming and things like that, there's quite a bit of information, but it's all for much cooler climate kind of things. And probably for bigger plots of land than what we have. <laughs> yeah, bigger than yeah, a little 10 by 10 foot square in a garden. You know, it's just... <laughs> yeah, I, called my, I actually called my local um, uh, farmer's co-op and asked about get, you know getting some barley seed, and they said, nope. You know we can't get it, so apparently it was a it's a tough year to even get barley seed to begin with, and uh, I ordered mine online I think from the same place that you got yours the is it Johnny Seeds, yeah, and yes. So, you know, got five pounds of it and planted uh, I planted two pounds the other day and and got enough to, left over to play with for either replanting or malting, uh, or maybe both. Well, let's uh, let's move on to uh, turbid mashing uh you know just when we we thought we knew everything about you know the different forms of mashing uh up comes this one and i guess uh this is this is a form of mashing that was that was kind of it shows the ingenuity of brewers uh to respond to legislation because this this came about uh, in response to a, a taxation law right yeah every uh Every country seems to get around to taxing beer, but they all uh, they all do it differently. Um, you know, in a lot of countries, it's you know how many barrels you produce, or you know the by the original gravity of your wort or whatever. In Belgium, for some reason, they began taxing people given the the size of the brew in the mash tun itself, which is kind of weird. So, you know, of course, what brewers strove to do then was make as thick a mash as possible, right? You don't want to have a, a thin mash increasing your, you know, increasing your volume and, you know, being taxed on all that just for, for a watery mash, you know, you want to make a mash as thick as possible. So turbid mashing is, is just a way of making an incredibly thick mash and, uh, but still getting, you know, a usable, uh, you know, word out of it. And, and it's also what, what they, consider a usable work might differ from our modern standards too mm-hmm. or and especially and depending on what style you're doing too it's not just a modern old thing it's they're you know they're a lot of the brews that you know come or you know are made from a turbid mash are meant to be sort of cloudy mm-hmm. you know we talked a bit about that with uh, randy mosher last time uh and he was talking about the brewers having these small mash tons and just stacking the grain, you know, piling up the grain in the mash tun, just trying to get as much uh, out of that small mash tun as possible. 
Um, so again, they're they're responding to these laws and trying to get around them, uh, and, and but at the same time, in, uh, introducing these new uh, brewing methods and beer styles uh, that that come as a response to this legislation. So maybe out of uh, out of challenging times comes uh, some good um, some good beers. Yes, yeah, it's, it's actually kind of interesting when you when you think about. There's so many beer styles around the world that, you know, although they taste good and we like them, one of the major, you know, shaping forces in them was was some sort of legislation. Like, you know, it's not, it's, you know, if you look at all, you know, German Doppelbox, there's there's a reason why they're all sort of clustered right around, you know, 7% alcohol because, you know, that's the cutoff or, or you know, the ABV equivalent in uh or I mean the OG equivalent. I, I forget exactly if if they define it by at gravity or or alcohol. But you know there's a there's a cutoff where if you're going to call a beer a doppelbock, it has to be over that. And you know there's you know uh, Scottish ales are well this this is not a tax is, tax issue, but I mean Scottish ales are typically not very hoppy, but that's because they can't you know they can't grow hops very well there, and they and they didn't like paying for them you know to have them shipped from England. So, you know, it's interesting that uh, a lot of our beer styles are, you know, it's not that someone sat down and said, I want to make a beer with, you know, these, uh, you know, characteristics. It's they, uh, a lot of them grew out of, you know, uh, what ingredients can we get? What's our taxation structure? What, you know, what will people buy? And, you know, it's a, it's a big compromise between all those things. So what are the characteristics of a, of a turbid mash? Turbid mash, well, it's very thick. And uh, also, I mean, given that these, you know, turbo mashing arose a while ago and, you know, was experimented with on a lot of different breweries, it's, there's probably not, you know, uh, one way they do it, you know, everywhere is all the same, but, but they, they share, you know, they, they share some similarities. And one is that, of course, that, that it's very, very thick. Um, the other is that it's a step mash. The... Uh, you know, they mash in a, at a relatively low temperature, take a couple steps to get up to, uh, you know, uh, the saccharification temperature, you know, the temperatures where uh, the starch is degraded into sugars. And um, they also, they produce uh, a wort that, that has a significant amount of cloudiness into it. Um, I mean, you can use this wort for... Uh, um, the work can be made into, you know, like a wit beer or, or you know, any sort of low gravity uh, uh, Belgian beer, that, you know, wheat beer with some sourness or or, not, or some cloudiness to it. And it's also used for making uh, the, the work for lambics, which are, you know, sour beers. And why would it be advantageous uh, for lambics? Well, specifically in the case of lambics, it's nice because you have all that extra stuff floating in the work, making it cloudy. But that... Um, you know, which, which includes proteins and, and, and tannins and all kinds of stuff, uh, a lot of which can be used as, um, you know, by the microorganisms uh, just for food uh, or, or nutrients, you know, because you, uh, when you make a lambic, the, uh, the initial fermentation, there, there's, a, there's a bunch of different organisms in the wort, but initially the uh, brewer's yeast takes over and, you know, uh, Ferments, ferments the wort very vigorously while the rest of the organisms are just sort of floating around doing their, you know, thing very, very slowly. Once uh, the brewer's yeast has used everything they can, then it's time for the uh, uh, the other organisms to keep continuing uh, on, like the, uh, you know, lactic acid uh, producing bacteria such as lactobacillus and pediococcus, and also the, you know, wild yeast strains like Britannomyces. You know, these things grow very slowly um, and the uh, the extra, you know, stuff from the turbid mash, the you know the things that that make the work cloudy are going to uh, provide uh, nutrients for those for for the long long uh, you know fermentation and conditioning process of a sour beer. So there's just more stuff for them to eat, and uh, it's just a different uh, a different makeup from a from a regular beer. What uh, what kind of ingredients are we looking at? This isn't just a standard uh, two-row ma- uh, mash with, uh, you know, little specialty grains thrown in there, right? Um, yeah, the mash, I mean, I, I think you could do, 
uh, you know, you could do whatever you wanted, really, but the traditional one is one that, that's based on pale malt, but typically had a high um, amount of adjuncts. Uh, you know, they would use uh, unmalted wheat was one adjunct that, that uh, Belgian brewers would use quite a bit. Uh, oats or rye uh, may have also been used uh, somewhat, but yeah, there's typically... Uh, Along with the pale barley malt and perhaps some wheat malt, there's also, uh, or typically was, uh, a decent chunk of uh, unmalted wheat. Hmm. And what are, are there steps that you need to take with unmalted wheat before you use it in the mash? Well, uh, if you're using unmalted uh, grains, the, you know they're not going to have uh, one the enzymes to convert themselves. That that'll have to come from other. Parts, but two, um, you know, they're going to have a hard uh, interior to the grain. You know, malting grain makes it very, very soft, and so you need when you use unmalted uh, grains in a beer, you need some way to, to break up the starches in the middle of that unmalted grain and get those into solution. Um, and there, there's a couple ways of doing this. Uh, one very common way in in brewing is to do a cereal mash, where you'll uh, you'll basically boil. The, uh, the unmalted uh, the unmalted grain along with a little bit of malted grain to soften it up. In a turbid mash, that's sort of taken care of because it's a uh, it's a decoction mash. You pull uh, or sort of a decoction mash. Mm-hmm. You you boil parts of the mash for, for times and then you turn return it to the uh, the mash ton and you know uh, that gets repeated and repeated. So the uh, you know the at least most of the unmalted wheat should get boiled at some part, at some part of the uh, you know the mash regime. So what are, what kind of equipment are we looking at? What all are we going to need gear wise to to pull off a turbid mash? Um, if you're going to do it at home, you need uh, a couple things. Uh, one, you need uh, basically like a, a big colander or a wicker basket or or something to use to uh, collect some of your wort. Because what you do in the middle of a turbid mash is you you mash in very thickly, then you push down on this uh, this device, and they called it a, a stukmanden. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that anywhere close to correctly. Um, but uh, it was basically a, a big wicker basket, and they'd you know, just physically press it into the mash, and then you know the, the liquid would pool up inside that basket, and they would pump, that up, pump off the liquid from that, and then you know that uh, that first part, you know the turbid part would would get boiled, and then later return to the uh, uh, the mash. And so you need something to serve as your you know your stuk mandan. Um, so you know uh, a big colander, or uh, you know or if you had some sort of wicker thing that was you know that was usable, something like that. Um, you'd also need a mash ton that didn't have a lot of. Uh, um, didn't have anything crushable inside it. You wouldn't want to be, you know, pressing down really hard if you had a temperature probe, you know, sticking right in the side, or you had, if your, uh, you know, if the manifold you're using was was, you know, uh, something that could be crushed by the force of that. You'd want to have something that you could, you know, apply a little bit of force to and not have to worry about. Um, other than that, that's really it. And uh, you know, a pump might help if you were doing a big enough one, but uh, if not, you could just scoop, you know, the wort out from inside the uh, the basket when you do it. Uh, so basically, just the basket and a, you know, a, a mash tun without, you know, that you're not worried about breaking. <laughs> and of course, you'd, you'd need uh, like a maybe a pot or two to use as uh, hot liquor, uh, hot liquor tanks or hot liquor uh, pots, uh, and yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe something to collect. Some of that uh, wort that you're going to treat along the way. Yeah, you need you need a hot liquor tank uh, because you know part of it is when you pull off one, uh, you know, one little bit of the like say when you pull off the turbid part of the mash, which is the first bit that, of wort that you pull off, you replace that with boiling water. Um, so you you need a hot liquor tank, and then you also need just a separate pot for uh, boiling the turbid. You know the. Uh, when you when you pull off the mash and heat it, you need you know a vessel for that. So yeah, you need a couple extra pots, uh, d- you know, depending on what your setup is currently. And uh, yeah. Now Dave Green wrote the article 
uh, in the July August issue of BYO, and he does a good job of uh, of walking us through it. In fact, there's a there's a flow chart there that you know, which is handy because it gets kind of confusing all these different steps and uh, and all that you you've got to do. So so start us at the top. I mean, wh- where do we where do we start with this process? Yeah, this. Uh, just trying to understand the process from having someone explain it to you, you're, you're bound to get confused. So the, uh, the, uh, the the chart helps out a lot. Um, basically, you start off and you've got you've got your small pot, your mash tun, and your hot liquor tank. You, you dough in at first, which is uh, you know just adding the water, and basically you dough in just ludicrously thickly, um, and and at a temperature of about 113 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So then you need to bring the uh, you need to bring the wort up to uh, right around 136, sort of a you know what used to be called a protein rest. Mm-hmm. Um, so you'd add boiling water for that, um, and that that brings up your mash to uh, it's still really thick. It's still right at that point. It's only maybe half as much water as you normally would have used mm-hmm. to mash in, um, and temperatures at about. 136. So, so you've got this thick mash sitting there, um, and then what you do is push your basket down. You know, let let some of the liquid well up from there, and uh, pump that out, scoop that out. Somehow move that liquid to, you know, your small pot, and then while the mash proceeds in your small pot, you heat that turbid portion up, and what that does uh, is it sort of fixes part of the wort to be cloudy mm-hmm. because you've got you know any enzymes that that would have worked to you know degrade uh, starches or whatever are are just you know boiled in there and they're denatured. Okay, um, so in the meantime, you're boiling your turbid part, and in the main mash, you add yet another addition of boiling water uh, that sort of replaces what you just pulled off of the turbid. And that now you've raised the temperature of the main mash to 150, and at this point it's it's still, still thick. It's maybe a little bit slightly thicker than, or thinner than when you pu- pulled the, the uh, you know quote unquote decoction when you pulled off the turbid part, but it's still really thick. Yeah, to to give an indication of how thick this mash is, uh, you know most people generally mash with a ratio of like a a quart or 1.25 quarts per of water per pound of grain well in the first uh the first step this first infusion or when you're mashing in or when you're doughing in uh i think dave said that it was um, like 0.3 quarts per pound yeah so you're talking about some gloppy stuff at that point yeah it, you know it's uh if you do a mash let's say you know most people mash somewhere between one and two quarts uh per pound of grain uh you know maybe a little bit thinner for some styles but you know, one quart of of you know liquid per pound of grain is that's a thick mash. That's you know it's uh, you know it's liquid, but it's but it's thick. Mm-hmm. So a third of that, yeah, you're just it's just oatmeal. You know, it's not there's no free water um, uh, at that point. You know, it's just very thick and thick and gloppy. And even you know towards the towards the middle of the mash, the thinnest you you get it really is like at about 0.6 quarts mm. per. Uh, you know, uh, per pound of grain. So you're the whole time you're working with a very, very thick mash. And again, if you're if you are regulated by the size of your mash tun, you want to get as much stuff in there, as much uh, grain in there as possible. And and if that space is taken up by water, you know, then that's that's uh, less advantageous to you. So that that's mm-hmm. kind of the, that's kind of the thinking behind this whole uh, this whole thing. So where are we? We are we have uh, taken off our first part, right? And we're boiling we, our turbid and our our mash is at 150. And we and yeah, we've replaced it with with boiling water to make to raise the the uh, uh, the temperature of the mash up. So now we're in the in the range where those enzymes are starting to turn those starches into sugars. Right. You rest at the main mash rests at uh, 150 for about 30 minutes. And what what you then do is you get to use your uh, street commandant again. You uh, push it back into the the mash again. This time the mash is a little bit thinner, so you, you'll be able to, to hopefully get uh, 
you know, a decent amount more wort in your little basket. Um, pump that over to, you know, the same pot or, or to scoop it over uh, to the same pot that you're boiling the turbine mash in and, you know, combine those two and keep, you know, uh, keep that heating. So then what you do is you add another boiling water infusion to your mash, basically however much you pulled off in the second, uh, you know, sort of decoction there, because uh, it's a reverse decoction because you're pulling the liquid, not the, mm-hmm. the grain. Mm-hmm. Um, but however much you pulled off, however much you pulled liquid and put in the small pot, put that much boiling water back in, and that gets you back to your uh, back to your normal uh, uh, mash thickness, you know, and, and which at a, at a Belgian brewery would have been that thick, and that would have been right to the rim of the, uh, you know, the mash tun. Mm-hmm. Although in, in your home brewery, you might, you know, that, that might not be exactly how you're doing it. Um, so then you have, you know, uh, by adding the boiling water, you boost it up to about 160, uh, 162, which that'll take care of, you know, uh, in the end, uh, uh, just, you know, it should serve to get the, the rest of the uh, starch degraded if there's any still at that point. Um, and then you start running off to your kettle and, you know, combine the uh, combine the turbid liquid uh, with the, you know, that you've been boiling with the, the liquid coming off the mash tun. And, you know, from there on, it's boiling or, you know, brewing as you normally do, you know, with the exception that you might turn it into a lambic at the end. But, mm-hmm. uh but that's the uh, a rough cut of the uh, of the mashing procedure, and uh, I mean, in in Belgian uh, breweries, they uh, you know if you read seven articles on turbid mashing, uh, if you could find them, you know you'd probably find fourteen different descriptions of it because it's not uh, you know any one exact standardized thing you know. Uh, so as a home brewer, you should really you know, familiar, familiarize yourself with the process, what's, you know, what you're trying to accomplish and, you know, sort of pick a, pick a turbid mash schedule that'll work for you, you know, think about what temperatures you want to hit. And also another, uh, another key, um, cause I was talking with Dave who, who, who had done this and, you know, he made a, he made a Creek with it and I think he made a wet beer too. One suggestion might be to, as a home brewer, um, give yourself a little bit of break and the first time you try it go with a little bit thinner mash mm. you know that the belgian tax authorities aren't going to be you know <laughs> <laughs> examining your setup so help yourself out and uh you know start out a little thinner um just till you get the uh you know till you get the uh the, the hang of it and then you know maybe if you if you know you want to brew an ultra traditional one uh try it you know with a you know, with an absolutely full mash ton and, and the full thickness and you know get the get the feel of doing that so uh, just like in our discussion about the decoction mashing uh, you know some people are going to say wow that that sounds really interesting that sounds a lot of fun I think I'm going to try that uh, and other people are going to say god that just sounds like a lot of trouble so <laughs> to the naysayers what do you say uh, to to maybe argue the point of why they they might want to try this kind of thing well um obviously the naysayers have a point and that this is a is a long sort of complex process and one that you know probably your brewery isn't set up for um uh you know and and it's certainly something you wouldn't you know if you're going to go ahead and make a pale ale or a porter or something you're not going to mess around with this because it's you know it, it ends up producing cloudy wort but i would say if you're if you're interested in belgian beers you know, and also you're interested maybe in, in authentic brewing methods. And, you know, also if you're just, I mean, I do a lot of sort of weird experimental brew days every year. And, you know, it can be just fun. You know, I've, I've done a billion, or not a billion, but, you know, a large number of just single infusion mashes. And, you know, I like I like an ordinary brew day. That's great. But, you know, sometimes it's just fun to try something. And, and in this case, if you're brewing, you know, if you want to brew like a, a wit beer or a lambic or just some sort of uh, uh, just sort of some sort of Belgian beer. I mean, one thing that these were used for uh, uh, the turbine mash. A lot of times they'd end up making a, a low gravity style of beer, but given that all the 
all the starches weren't converted, and and that's actually a big part of where the uh, this, the uh, the cloudiness came from. I think I said proteins earlier, which there is, but the starch is the main contributor to the to the, the cloudiness. Uh, you know, if you have a, a a beer with a lot of those things that are, aren't fermentable, you can make a low gravity beer that still has a nice body. Mm-hmm. So if you were interested in trying, you know, uh, making some low gravity Belgian stuff but still had a nice uh, body and mouthfeel to it. Uh, a turbid mash, you know, might be something fun to do. Yeah, Randy, at, at again, Randy Mosher's presentation at uh, the the Cincinnati conference, they had six uh, beers that were done in these old fashioned Belgian uh, brewing methods, and they were really interesting. I mean, most of them were really good, and they mm-hmm. were low gravity beers. And we were talking about some of them were in the range, I believe. Three percent alcohol, maybe, sure. And, and really, you know, none of them were were really thin and unsatisfying. They would, you know, I would I would gladly have, uh, you know, a beer like that every day because it it was nice and you know there was good mouthfeel, um, you know there was there was a lot of character to the beer. So, you know, the the methods that that they used to get these beers, where you you get you get a session beer, you get a low alcohol beer. It's not going to get you hammered. And, but at the same time, it's satisfying to a sophisticated palate. Yeah, one thing, um, I can't remember if Dave mentioned it in the article or not, or if it made it into the final version, but one thing that apparently in, in World War II, when you know low-gravity beers were being brewed a lot because of uh, you know restrictions or whatever uh, with, with ingredients, when, when British troops came to... Uh, to Belgium or whatever, and drank the beers there. They were very surprised at, uh, you know, the beers, beers were low in alcohol. Not that that was a, too different from from England, but they they had just you know a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, sort of thickness and chewiness and mouthfeel that that sort of surprised the British troops. And you know, a lot of that was due to um, that you know many of the beers coming from breweries that employed this this type of mashing. Well, cool. Well, I don't. This is another technique that I don't know if I'll ever get around to doing, but it sure is. <laughs> it sure is cool to know about it, and uh, you know, who knows uh, if I if I have time to uh, to have a really interesting brew day and maybe have a, a load of friends over and lots of beers to drink. Uh, that this would be a fun one to do. I'm thinking of doing it um, one of these years uh, when. A, Given that unmalted wheat played a big role in it, if, if I get a decent wheat crop some year, mm. it would still wheat, you know, I would have grown it, uh, you know, and I can use that in, in a, because I like low gravity session beers, you know, and I like Belgians with a, you know, sort of weedy Belgian with, with you know, some nice phenolics from the, uh, uh, you know, the yeast. And, um, you know, I'd love to make like sort of a wit beer thing using homegrown wheat. And I think that would be, fun in addition, you know, to use, you know, use this uh, interesting mash technique to, you know, that would both help me deal with the ingredient and, and B, give me a, a character in the beer that I think would be kind of interesting. Well, excellent. And uh, if, you, if you want more details on the, uh, the turbid mashing technique, check out the July-August issue of Brew Your Own. Once again, Chris, we appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks again to Chris Colby. You can read more about turbid mashing in the July-August issue of BYO. You can get a free copy of of Brew Your Own magazine by clicking on the banner ad on basicbrewing.com. And if you decide to subscribe after reading that issue, you'll be helping to support this podcast. And we appreciate everybody who's done that. It's a great deal. It's a great magazine. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, you can write to me, James, at basicbrewing.com, or you can fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from and check your email address as well. Uh, you can check out our low-tech lagering and decoction mashing DVD on, on our site while you're there, where you can see Steve Wilkes do a single-step decoction mash, and you can follow me through a lager fermentation in the middle of summer where I don't use a dedicated chest freezer. There are also our original DVDs, Basic Brewing Introduction to Extract Home Brewing, 
Uh, in that one, we walk you through the extract brewing process, step by step, from boiling to bottling. And in basic brewing, stepping into all grain, we take you through the all grain process, from milling your grain to collecting your wort. We've got combo deals on the site to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time. And you can see a, a listing of the a growing listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. And that's where you can also see our shirts, new colors of the shirts. We now have six colors to choose from. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Smokinator 1000. Transform your 22-inch Weber kettle into an efficient smoker. And someone bought a Kindle through the link. So we appreciate that as well. We get a little extra. A little extra bump from a Kindle purchase. So we do appreciate your support. Thanks again, everybody. Remember, I can't tell who who bought what. Or who what bought on <laughs> if you're buying Dr. Seuss uh, on <laughs> through that link. So uh, just use that uh, Amazon. Just click on the Amazon.com logo the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We appreciate your support. That's it. Till next week. Till then. Thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson down in Austin. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.